Good evening. As you are entering, please remember to mute yourself. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, my um, team. Uh, well, first, by introducing myself, I'm Pat Banker. I'm from Franklin County, New York. I'm actually from the Adirondack Mountains, where right now it is only about 60 degrees out. Um, MB, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I am MB. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Warren County. I'm a resource educator and I'm glad to be here and have a chance to listen to Pat uh, teaching again. You're in for a real treat tonight. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm John Bow. I'm the 4-H team coordinator for Warren County and I work with Mary Beth uh, at the office in Warrensburg um, and have worked with Pat for, oh boy, quite a few years now, Pat. I think it's uh, 18 and a half, but we've worked probably most closely for the last five years specifically on this project. It's been a while. We've actually run into each other quite a bit over that 18 year period. Yeah. So we will begin tonight um, going over some of the uh, safety that you need to do when you're going to be handling or eating plants that are found out in the wild. All the plants that we're going over tonight are found in the Eastern United States. Some are native, some are very invasive. And you're going to learn a lot of the identifiers and most important, use your senses of sight, touch, unless it says, please don't touch without gloves. Smell, taste only when you're 100% certain. And if you wanna be sure that it's something that's not going to cause an allergic reaction to you specifically, uh, crush a small amount of the plant, uh, place it on the inside of your arm or the inside of your wrist and let it sit there for a little while. If it doesn't cause a red rash or reaction, you then can go on to taste a very small amount of it. Use at least two good sources for identification. By good sources, I don't mean there are a lot of uh, groups on social media that do a lot of uh, by picture identification and you will get a lot of um, I think it is, or it looks like, use some really good sources. There are a lot out there. And I usually joke around and say, use at least two good sources and someone who's not dead yet, because if they're not dead yet and they've been eating all this, they probably are doing a good job. Some of the plants that we will look at tonight may have dangerous lookalikes, so always be 100% certain. If you'd like to put in the chat box what you th think the three three uh, items on the right are, that would be fun. But you will see what they are a little later in the slideshow. The reason we're doing this program is to encourage people to participate in food security activities. All these plants are available, they're free. All the other is is a little bit of sweat equity into procuring them. They are, most of them are uh, nutritional powerhouses and to foster awareness of historical sociological food uses. But always be sure of the possible risks of eating things that you only think you know what it is. And we wanna promote ethical harvesting behavior. There is a rule of one third, never take more than one third of any plant uh, that is out there unless it's something like dandelion, which uh, basically there's so much of it, eat all you want. But of everything else, never take more than one third of anything. And on some things, harvest them, such as the ramps that are pictured on the left of the screen. Uh, make sure that you harvest in a, in a very ecologically um, safe manner because they are disappearing in many places. It's actually against the law to harvest more than one person can eat at a sitting in um, just north of me in um, Canada. 
So be sure that you harvest ethically. Wild animals have a rich history in the evolution of the human species. We were gatherers even before we were hunters and gatherers. And there's a very strong current interest among youth and adults right now in uh, finding wild foods and readily available foods that are out there. Some wild edibles can be easily over har harvested. I can't stress that enough because just because it looks like there's a lot of them doesn't mean go take them because a lot of them will not grow back if they're over harvested. And I'll harp on the ramps again. There was a study done by St. Lawrence University, which is very close to me, that estimated some of the patches in the area that I live in will take as long as 75 years for those ramps to come back to what they were as little as 25 years ago. And many wild edibles may occur only, on, only significantly on private property. Always request permission before harvesting on private land. This is not a certification course. Make sure that you test to help determine personal sensitivity. And again, be 100% certain. Don't harvest within 200 feet of a roadway because of all the pollutants from the vehicles um, and the runoff coming from the salt. In an urban area where brown fields may occur, what brown field means is that um, many vacant lots, uh, everything in it looks dead because you have no idea what has been used on that vacant lot. Uh, I wouldn't suggest harvesting anything within an urban area just because you have no idea what has been used on the uh, ground there. Uh, I do know someone who does uh, wild edible tours in uh, Central Park in New York City. Uh, he's very good, uh, but I wouldn't eat anything that came out of Central Park on a bet. Don't harvest anything on the edges of farm fields or along power lines and right of ways. Uh, we eat things that come out of the farm fields because they're being grown, but the things that grow on the edges of farm fields, a lot of them will store some of the uh, chemicals that are used on the uh, plants to kill weeds and to, um, uh, and we don't want to eat uh, an abundance of it. Don't harvest land, uh, again, on land that's private without permission, and don't harvest near potentially contaminated water sources like ditches and runoffs from, from uh, any kind of uh, industrial plant. And don't harvest in any state or federal park. There are some exceptions. Uh, they won't bother you if you're picking blueberries or raspberries, but if you're picking a lot of other things, uh, make sure you know what the law is in your area. It is the sole responsibility of class participants to identify plants with 100% certainty. All plants may cause an allergic reaction, so make sure you test. And all traditional or historical medicinal uses stated for each plant included are for educational purposes only. Consult with a physician for any medical treatment. And this material is copyright protected. There are wild edibles in this section that we're going to do tonight. One is stinging nettle, evening primrose, elderberry, Jerusalem artichoke, cattails, white pine, and staghorn sumac. And there's just a little advertising blurb on the right because we work, all work with 4-H. <laughs> Check with your local cooperative extension office if you have youth interest in learning about wild edibles. 4-H curriculum is available to adults wishing to work with youth after being trained titled New York's Natural Resources 4-H at Wild Edibles, a guide to tradition, safety, and conservation. Trained leaders may be available to work with youth ages 12 and older in counties throughout New York State. Uh, we'd like to see it go farther than New York State. All plants included in the curriculum are available in the eastern United States. This is stinging nettle, Yurtica dioica. Uh, Yurtica species contain 35 plants, but stinging nettle has to be the most choice of all of them. Some of you may be familiar with another uh, 
plant in this family known as purple dead nettle and also wood nettle. Both of them are quite edible. Neither of them are as tasty as stinging nettle. Stinging nettle will cause a rash when leaves or stems contact bare skin in most people. Leaves and stems are covered in hollow hairs that release formic acid when touched. Afterwards, the raised rash is commonly itchy, but all symptoms should dissipate within five to 24 hours. Do not scratch or rub the area, no matter how much it itches. Wash with soap and water. Handle only with leather gloves while wearing long sleeve shirt and long pants with socks to avoid skin contact with this plant. As with all plants, in rare cases, very rare cases, serious reactions may occur. Immediately see a physician if severe reaction occurs. In very rare cases, some people may not have a severe reaction externally, but may have a reaction when they eat the plant. So always, if you've never eaten it, eat a very small amount. To identify stinging nettle, it's found in moist fields, fertile soil around farms, disturbed areas and along tree lines. It's not native to North America, but it's native to Europe, but it's wildly and widely naturalized in North America. It appears in early spring through fall, and the best time to harvest is early or late spring for the full plant, but all summer long you can uh, harvest the leaves and the seeds. Stinging nettle stems are singular, rarely branched, and the plant can grow two to four feet tall. The stems are sharply angled, typically four angled hollow with bristly stinging hairs. It's not as angled as the mint stem. If you've ever handled mint, that is very, very much a square stem, but it is angled and you can see the angles and you can see the opposite leaves. Leaves are ovate with sharply toothed margins, a heart shaped base, and they have every part of the plant has stinging hairs. The young spring leaves are often tinged with red when the plant is short, uh, about four or five inches tall. Leaves are always opposite on the stem. Stinging nettle is a dioecious plant with male and female flowers growing on separate plants. It's rather interesting, but if you were to take one stinging nettle plant and put it off by itself, not near any others, it would send out a shoot that would become either male or female so that each plant coming from that plant, one is a male and one is a female. Roots of this plant are rhizomes of the parent plant capable of creating large colonies. Colonies formed by rhizomes, hardy roots, and by seeding. So if you want to make your own patch of stinging nettle, uh, it will be quite healthy and it will spread. And the way I actually have it cultivated at my house, I keep it all spring and it behaves itself and stays where I want it. Plants can be very long lived and can live as, as long as 50 years. So unless you really want it around and don't want to use chemicals, um, <laughs> make friends with it. Singing nettle is considered a nutritional powerhouse. Besides tasting really good. As a fairly high levels of a host of minerals, including calcium, iron, manganese, silica, iodine, sodium, and sulfur. They are a very good source of vitamin C, beta carotene, and B complex vitamins. Nettles are 10% protein, which is higher than any other vegetable. So it is actually better for you than spinach. All sting is removed by blanching, cleaned and rinsed leaves in boiling water for one to two minutes. So if you wish to handle it between what you have harvested it in and a colander to rinse it off, make sure that you use tongs or gloves to handle it even when it's in the house because rinsing it with cold water will not remove the sting. Nettles have been used to make cordage, which is string or rope, nets, cloth resembling linen, 
paper, dyes, and insect repellents. Nettle has been used as a rennet substitute in the making of cheeses since Anglo-Saxon times. And I, I have included how to make rennet from nettles for anyone who'd like to make cheese. Teas made from nettle were used to help nursing mothers produce more milk. Traditional medicine uses the seeds, leaves, and roots to treat a multitude of ailments, including anemia, arthritis, asthma, burns, eczema, inflammations, seasonal allergies, kidney stones, and urinary tract ailments. To make nettle greens as a side dish, you can actually use nettles in any dish calling for spinach, so they make a wonderful quiche, and any other in stir fries. Directions, pick young nettle greens, both leaves and stems, make sure you use gloves, by either snapping off the stem or use kitchen shears. Rinse greens in a colander, drain, place greens, no water added. Don't drop them into boiling water uh, if you're going to cook them. You do not need to blanch them first. <laughs> pan or frying pan, simmer on medium heat until all greens are tender, stirring frequently. Drain liquid, saving it as a delicious tea. Serve greens hot with butter, vinegar, crumbled bacon, or any other seasoning of your choice. Um, I highly recommend stinging nettle. It's a wonderful ingredient in pesto, and it's a wonderful ingredient in any stir fry. Unlike spinach, sometimes you eat fresh spinach uh, cooked, and it, it kind of leaves this um, gritty feel in your teeth. Stinging nettle doesn't do that. This is vegetarian rennet from stinging nettle. Rennet used in making cheese traditionally comes from enzymes found in the stomachs of ruminant animals. So gather one pound of fresh nettle leaves which will make enough homemade rennet for two gallons of milk. You can use goat or sheep milk or cow's milk. It won't work in uh, so-called milks such as um, uh, almond milk or any of the other milks that are made from plant-based. Rinse the leaves thoroughly under cold water, then add them to a pot with two cups of water. Bring the pot to the verge of boiling, then cover it and let the leaves simmer for 30 minutes. Once the leaves are ready, add half a teaspoon of sea salt to the mixture. This helps break down the leaves and extract the enzyme and stir until it's dissolved. Line a colander with cheese and set it inside a clean bowl. Pour the nettle liquid and leaves through the cheesecloth and let it drain until it stops dripping. Use half of this infusion, about one cup per gallon of milk. Until you're ready to make the cheese, keep your rennet tightly covered in a non-transparent container. Don't put it in a mason jar or a clear bowl because the enzyme will not work well when it's exposed to light. Follow cheese making recipes for making curd or soft cheeses such as Gouda from this point. Cheeses made from nettle rennet will be softer then from animal base rennet, and we'll have a tang that goes well with making cheese or sheep's milk. This is a picture of a gouda like cheese that is made. It's wonderful spread on crackers or anything else that you need. It's a little bit softer than gouda, but not a lot, and it's delicious. Any questions? This is common evening primrose. Onothera biennis. It is native to North America. It's often found in poor soil, waste places, edges of fields, lawns, vegetable gardens, and may be found in open woods. Evening primrose is a biennial. The first year plant is a basil or rosette. And as you can see here, it's in a rosette pattern that stays very close to the ground, and it will not form a central stem in its first year. The first plant, your plant has a dark green lancelot leaves, often tinged with red. You can see the red tinting in these two shots. First year plant appears early in the spring and will remain green after many frosts. There are no known dangerous lookalikes. The second year plant grows two to six feet tall with alternate lancelot leaves on branch stems. There's a white vein that runs down the first year and the second year plant. And you can see it here. 
The margin of the leaves are smooth or slightly toothed. Stems are light to olive green, sometimes tinged with red and covered with tiny white hairs. Uh, you will fe feel a slight fuzziness to any part of the uh, evening primrose plant. Root the second year flowering plant will become woody as it matures. So harvest the second year plant root in the early spring before the plant forms flower buds. The leaves, flowers, roots, all seed pods, all part of evening primrose are edible. Bright yellow flowers have a lemon scent when open, AKA it's also known as the lemon drop plant. The flowers bloom from midsummer to early fall and only in the evening to late morning, hence the name common evening primrose. Seed pods are narrow and they're much <coughs> like the buds on this plant, on this flower. Seed pods are narrow containing many tiny, very tiny brown seeds. The pods split when ripe and the seeds are tiny enough to be dispersed by the wind. Um, this plant is also very hard to get rid of if you start having it in your yard. Seeds may, may remain viable in the soil for up to 70 years. Native Americans used every part of the evening primrose for medicinal uses. The Ojibwe made poultices from all parts of the plant to help heal bruises. The Cherokee made teas from the root to help with weight loss. European settlers and the Shakers began using plant as a medicine in the 1700s. The leaves and roots were made into a tea to ease nausea and stomach pains. As you can see, this actually would be an early second year plant. It's got the evening primrose root has a very distinctive red top to the root, red crown. Uh, looks very much like a radish color. The leaves of both the first and second year plant can be eaten raw in salads, they're delicious in salads, stir fried, added to soups and stews, or cooked as any other green. The flavor is much like milder turnips, some people say. I say it tastes more like, um, it's a little radishy, greens and somewhat peppery. The tapper of the first year plant, the early second year plant may be eaten raw and um, it tastes if you scrape the root with your thumbnail, you're going to smell more of a radish smell and a, than a uh, parsnip smell. It's wonderful the root shredded into coleslaw, stir fried or cooked as any root vegetable. I would take this entire plant, uh, cut the root off, clean the root up um, and wash and chop up the leaves a little and throw the whole thing into a stir fryer or a soup. The flavor is sweet, resembling parsnip or radish. Scraping the root will release the smell, similar to radish. Flowers are actually very tasty and have a lemon pepper taste. And they're a wonderful addition to salads, but if you're going to pick them and want them a little bit open, you're gonna to have to make your salad in the evening or in the early morning. Young sea bat pods may be steamed or cooked, much like string beans, and are wonderful with string beans, corn, and peas. Here's a recipe for evening primrose root soup. Find two cups, which is not hard. If you have it growing anywhere, it tends to be everywhere. Two cups of evening primrose roots cut into bite-sized pieces. Two cups of Jerusalem artichokes. So this dish is made in the fall. Two quarts of water or chicken stock. One cup wild leek leaves chopped or cultivated leek bulbs and tops. Two to three tablespoons of bacon fat or butter. Two tablespoons chopped. Fresh dill weed is optional. Milk, dairy, or almond to taste, salt and pepper to taste. Place the butter, fat, in a skillet at medium high heat, add roots, tubers, and leeks. Saute until all the roots and tubers are light golden colored and leeks are softened. Combine roots, tubers, water, stock, and leeks in a large pot, bring to a boil, cover and simmer approximately 40 minutes. Add milk, salt and pepper, and dill to taste at the end of the cooking process. Soup may be served as is, or you can run it through a, a blender and puree it. I prefer it with the chunks. This is staghorn sumac. 
Staghorn sumac prefers dry ground. Poison sumac prefers wet ground. Leaves are opposite, slightly toothed and pinnate, which is another name for feather shape. And if you look at them, they look like a feather drawing. Sumac flowers made to July and fruit can ripen from June to September. Uh, where I live in the Adirondack Mountains, they aren't even close to forming fruit yet. The fruit often lasts through winter and into spring and you'll see the birds eating them throughout the winter. Um, this actually is not a flower. These are the berries or the fruit of the staghorn sumac. The fruit of staghorn sumac is one of the most identifiable due to its dense cone-shaped clusters of small red droops at the terminal end of the branches. The stems are velvety and light colored. I will tell you that handling the stems and the leaves of uh, staghorn sumac sometimes causes a slight itching um, reaction to some people. So before you handle it, um, take the, a bit of the stem and put it lightly on the inside of your wrist and see if you have a reaction to the stems. This is poison sumac, which really doesn't look much like staghorn sumac. Um, the shrub or small tree with widely spaced leaves. It can and it can be long, very long leaves, and they're toothless, always toothless. Shrubs are six to twenty feet tall. Twigs and buds are hairless. There is no fuzz on anything. The bark is smooth, dark, and speckled with darker spots. The berries are white, small, and in drooping clusters. Poison sumac can be found in partly wooded swamps or wet areas. Do not touch. Contact can cause severe skin reaction. Skin symptoms are often worse than those of its relative poison ivy. Sumac aid is absolutely wonderful and tastes like pink lemonade. To make sumac aid, use one to two cups of the berries per quart of cold water. Allow to sit in the water for a half hour to an hour. I prefer two cups or, and less water. Strain through fine mesh or coffee filter, sweeten to taste. It will be a pretty pink and very lemony. Harvesting the berries after it rains will greatly lessen the flower, so make sure that flavor, so make sure that you uh, harvest the berries on a sunny day. Uh, ground up dried berries made into a powder with the seeds removed. Add a lemon-like flavor to salads or meat and is often used in Middle Eastern dishes. Um, I use it quite often to season a lot of, I like it on actually salads. Uh, you remove the seeds by actually winnowing it afterwards so that the heavier matter leaves when it is uh, shaken on a fine screen. Native Americans mix the leaves and berries with a smooth and staghorn sumac to extend their tobacco. Tannins made from the bark of berries were used to tan leather that was flexible, lightweight, and light in color. Decoctions made from the berries were used to help mothers produce more milk and ease cramping. Traditionally used to treat urinary tract infections and digestive pro problems. Uh, the sumac berries are very high in vitamin C and antioxidants. Elderberry or black elder, Sambucus canadensis or Sambucus nigrans. The bark is very distinctive. It has wort-like dispersed lenticels. I tell everybody to look for the, bra the bark that has braille on it. Stems contain white pith and they're hollow. So if you were to break off uh, a stem about this size, the inside would be hollow. It actually is such a strong wood that when it was dried, it was used as uh, spigots to um, hammer into uh, maple trees to collect sap. Elder flowers are flat top kinds and they appear in June to July and found at the end of the branches. 
Flowers are often made into cordials, and a cordial is when, well, you can use uh, liquor, but you can also use water. You take the uh, flower and um, infuse uh, water with it, make sure the stems aren't attached, uh, the deeper stems, and allow it to sit in the water, add some sugar after it has sat for a while and serve it as a beverage. They're delicious dipped in a light tempura type batter and fried. The berries are used to make syrups, wine, and jelly. And the, they're always formed in a droop. This is a droop. You uh, will find the flowers, or the flowers in early summer and, and uh, the berries in late summer. It's a deciduous erect shrub. It'll grow as much as uh, 25 feet tall. It's very native, except that the the um, Sambucus nigrans is also found in Europe. Leaves, bark, sap, and unripe berries are all toxic. They are uh, will make you sick. So don't um, allow anyone to take the hollow. Uh, fresh stems and use it as a straw or any other uh, item because it will make you sick. Flowers and ripe berries are edible. The plant really prefers damp soil. According to the CDC, the fresh leaves, flowers, bark, seeds, young buds, and particularly the roots contain a bitter alkaloid and glucoside that can produce hydrocyanic acid, which leads to cyanide poisoning. Berries should always be cooked prior to eating. If you eat the black um, to dark purple elderberries uh, directly off the tree, they're much like eating a choke cherry and are hardly easily palatable. So the chances of eating a lot of them and becoming poison are pretty slim. This is actually red elderberry. The berries won't turn black, but they stay this bright red. And um, although it is also edible, it is not palatable, no matter what you do with it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it is, the berries have a distinctive smell, as does the tree, a little like wet gym socks. Although the fully ripe berries are edible, they should always be cooked. Elderberries may be dried to be used to make syrups, wines, and jellies at a later date. You can dry them by collecting the black elderberries and uh, drying them in a dehydrator and using them to make syrups at a later date. Eating the dried berries may make someone sick if for some reason they ate too many of them. To make elderberry syrup. Elderberry syrup, you will find the uh, Sambucus, Sambuca, and a lot of over-the-counter cough syrups and medicines right now. It is thought to uh, help stave off viruses and for colds, it's uh, it relieves a lot of the symptoms. So you first gather three cups of cleaned and destemmed black elderberries, collecting them as a matter of breaking them off of the branches. Um, in order to clean them, I usually take a fork, um, a regular fork, remove the berries from the stems. It, because otherwise, pulling each berry off the stems is very time consuming. In order to really clean them afterwards, uh, I put them in a bowl of uh, cold water uh, and uh, a lot of the little white things and tips and ends will float to the top and the berries will go to the bottom and you can skim that off and uh, then drain the berries. Add to three cups of cleaned and destemmed berries to one cup of water, add two tablespoons of raw and fil filtered honey and one teaspoon of fresh lemon juice. I also like to add usually an eighth to a quarter teaspoon of grated fresh ginger 
or ground cinnamon or a pinch of cloves, a dash of vanilla. Place the three cups of ripe, clean, or destemmed elderberries in a medium saucepan. Cover with one cup of water and place on low heat. Cover the pan and simmer on low for 30 minutes. Periodic checks the color and taste of the liquid surrounding the berries. You want to achieve a deep purple color and a strong berry taste. It's not going to be a strawberry blueberry taste, but it will be a strong elderberry taste. Caution, don't simmer the berries too long. Doing so will create a really bitter taste and don't ask me how I know. Strain the berries and liquid through a fine mesh sieve into a bowl. Use the back of a wooden or stainless steel spoon to mash the berries against the side of the sieve to extract any remaining juice. Immediately add the honey, lemon juice, and any of the optional flavorings and stir to combine. Feel free to add more honey if you prefer a sweeter taste. Lay a little black elderberry syrup into sterilized canning jars and seal tightly. This will not be processed this way, so you will have to store it in a refrigerator and it will only store up to about four weeks this way in the refrigerator, so you have to use it immediately. To preserve the syrup for later use, because it's a lot of work, can you really want to have it in the wintertime? Label, ladle the hot black elderberry syrup into hot sterilized one pint canning jars. Add one tablespoon lemon juice, not fresh lemon juice. It has to be a concentrated lemon juice like real lemon in order to acidify it to each jar. That's one tablespoon to each jar. Elderberry syrup is low acid product that needs to be acidified to be safely preserved. Clean the jar room with a clean damp cloth, place lid and ring on the jar and finger tighten. Place each sealed canning jar into a canning pot that has enough water to cover each jar by one to two inches of water. Cover the pot and bring to a full boil. Allow the jars to boil for 10 minutes. Turn off the heat at the end of the 10 minutes. Allow the jars to set for another five minutes. Remove the jars using canning tongs from the hot water bath and place on a rack or towel to fully cool and complete the sealing process. If you are storing the jars um, after they have fully sealed and have cooled down, make sure you remove after about 12 hours the ring that is on the top because you should never store canned goods that you've home canned with the ring on as um, the rust that may form actually will break your seal in very micro places that you can't see it and can ruin your product. Always refrigerate the jars after opening. Syrup that has been safely canned may be stored in a cool, dry place out of the light for up to one year. Always remove the ring before storing. Jerusalem artichoke. This is native to North America, also known as sunchoke, Indian potato, earth apple. And if you harvest it at the wrong time, it's known by some people as fartichoke. Jerusalem artichoke plants grow from tubers preferring rich, moist, but not wet soil. Plants will grow often to a height of 10 feet in rich soil. This is in a, a picture taken in my backyard. These posts are three feet. And as you can see, this is how tall the plants are. They're outside of the picture. They will grow very tall. They'll actually grow to a height of 10 feet. Sometimes a little more. Flowers appear from a single, often branching stem as it nears the top of a mature plant. Leaves are single, usually serrated, and narrowly ovate in shape with a pointed tip. Leaves are usually opposite on the lower portion of the stem, but may be alternate near the top of mature plants. They're one of the latest flowering plants um, that flower usually mid to, they can flower as late as late September. So they are a wonderful plant for our bees and pollinators to uh, have available in late season. Tubers will form in late summer and can be found one to four inches below the surface of the soil. You don't have to dig deep to find the tubers. The tubers form from rhizomes horizontally from the base of the plant stalk. 
They will be two to five inches in length and may reach one and a half inches in diameter. The tubers are bumpy, cylindrical in shape and ranging in color from tan to reddish brown. Tubers may be harvested in the very early spring as soon as the ground is friable and again in late fall, early winter after the plant, the whole plant has frozen and died and there have been several frosts. If you dig uh, Jerusalem artichokes prior to the top of the plant being dead or uh, after several frosts, the uh, inulin that is in the plant will be hard to digest, hence causing the flatulence. So if you don't mind the flatulence, you can break, dig them a little early, but make sure you eat them with good friends or family. The plant stock leaves and flowers are as rough as sandpaper with stiff bristles. Every single part, including the flower petals, feel like sandpaper. The flowers appear late summer, early fall, and each plant may have one to several flowers. Jerusalem artichokes. Sunroots are not from Jerusalem, not related to artichokes, but are part of the sunflower family, the helianthus. And natives to North America, when Jerusalem artichokes were brought by Samuel de Champlain to Europe, the Italians named the flowering plant as Gerasole artichoke. Gerasole is an Italian word for turning towards the sun, because sunflowers always turn towards the sun. Over time, Gerasole was mispronounced, ending up as Jerusalem. The artichoke portion of its name came from the resemblance of the tuber's taste to that of artichoke hearts. The word artichoke comes from the Arab phrase artichoke, which means ground and thorny. Native Americans made the leaves and stalks into a tea to relieve rheumatism and joint swelling. And, <coughs> excuse me, mats were made using the tough stalks of the dried plant. Uh, I made a mat that's sitting outside and has been out there for about three years and it has not um, rotted or changed other than in color in that length of time. This is the cultivated variety of artichoke, uh, Jerusalem artichokes that you will find in stores. They're much bigger. Um, I prefer the taste of the more native one and uh, the flower that will form from this variety of Jerusalem artichoke will be a single flower resembling a small version uh, of the um, sunflower that we all recognize, but it will never form seeds. Uh, it will only be a, um, a flower that is very resembling a larger version of the ones that you saw on the plants shown. Jerusalem artichokes are potassium rich, heart friendly electrolyte that helps reduce blood pressure. The uh, tubers are iron rich, probably the highest amount of this trace element among the common edible roots and tubers. The tubers are high in antioxidants. Sunchokes are also the source of inulin and oligofructose, fructose, which are types of fiber that act as potent prebiotics or food for probiotics which are the good bacteria in your gut. Inulin is a soluble fiber that also works to balance your blood sugar. And they are inulin rich. Um, I enjoy taking them and uh, just washing them off and cutting the two little ends. Don't peel them because a lot of the flavor is in the peel and it's very thin. And by the time you got done peeling them, you would have not much left. Take one pound of sun chokes, washed, halved, or cut into one, one inch chunks. Three quarters of a cup of olive oil, two tablespoons dried thyme, one tablespoon of minced garlic, and a pinch of sea salt. And mix everything with the seasoning in a bowl, toss sun chokes to coat, arrange on a baking sheet in a single layer and bake for 35 to 45 minutes. I usually take and add uh, chunks of beet, also cut into one inch chunks and some potatoes and some chunks of carrot and whatever ground um, plants I have at the time from the garden and it's absolutely delicious. You really don't need anything else for dinner when you have it. 
cattail, Typha latifolia. The identification. Cattail is native to North America, but it's found around the world. And it has not changed since the time of the dinosaurs. It's a perennial, it grows four to eight feet tall. The leaves are pale green and sword shaped. And they're about a half to three quarters inch wide. The female flower heads are shaped like the uh, corn dogs and hot dogs on a stick and grow from a stiff central spike. The yellow pollen covered male portion of the plant grows above the female portion. The male portion generally falls off after the pollen has been released. It's found in marshlands along waterways, ditches, and many polluted water runoff sites because it can live in very polluted water. The blue flag iris and sweet flag will look very similar to cattail only in very early spring before the cattail flower and the central stem starts to appear. And both of them are toxic. Cattails grow from both rhizomes and seeds. This is the young female portion of the plant here. And this is the male portion of the plant with pollen on it. Rhizomes produce shoots in the fall that begin to sprout in the spring once sunlight can reach the wet soil. The yellow pollen covered male portion of the plant grows above the female portion. The male portion generally falls off after the pollen has been re released. When the female portion, which is here, is a little bit younger. It is definitely delicious to harvest that and uh, put it in some aluminum foil with a little bit of butter or oil and uh, allow it to steam on a grill or in the oven inside the aluminum foil. It tastes much like corn on the cob. The Native American used every part of the cattail in many ways. Roots rhizomes were fire roasted. Early shoots were eaten as a raw tree. Immature green flower heads were steamed by the fire. Pollen collected and added as a flower to make flatbreads. And the starchy rhizomes were collected for their thickening ability when added to stews and starch from rhizomes were dried to make flour. Dried cattail tails were used to start fires, dip in fats or pitch as torches, and reeds were used to make baskets and mats. The cattail was known as a supermarket of the swamp because every single part of it is useful or edible at some point in time during the year. In order to safely harvest cattails, only harvest them when they're found in a clean area free from industrial runoff, away from farm field drainage areas and away from road and highway drainage ditches. Make sure the water you harvest it from is clean doesn't have a lot of motor boats on it because uh, the cattail is absolutely amazing at what is known as phytoremediation or uh, removing heavy metals uh, from the water and a lot of pollutants and storing them to keep the water clean. And it does not hurt the cattail plant at all. In fact, the uh, cooling ponds at Chernobyl uh, have had cattails all around them and the water there is clean and the fish are gigantic because of the action of the cattail plant. The link here, if you wanted to write it down, is a fascinating study of just how, how well the cattail uh, plant works at cleaning waterways. In late or early, when late spring, early summer, harvest the hearts by pulling the center leaves of the young stalk from the plants before they reach up to four feet in height, and before the flower stalk appears. The central, what you will pull out will look very, will be looking like this. This is on my kitchen counter. It is crunchy like tender young celery. Grab the center leaves in a bunch and pull. The white center will easily pull from the plant and will slip right out. Remove the tough outer leaves. This will not harm the plant as harvesting actually stimulates the growth of this plant. So if you were to pull the stems out of a, out of several of the cattail plants, you'll actually find that it will uh, form a central stem again. The center heart will be very moist, white and crisp. Cattail celery is crunchy with a mild flavor that may be eaten raw and um, always suggest that you wash it in clean water before eating. 
Uh, that's kind of a do as I just told you, but not as I do, because if it's clean water, I will pull it out and eat it as is. You didn't hear me say that. The hearts may be sliced and tossed into a salad. And this is on my kitchen counter again. These are the tough leaves removed. And this will be tender at least until this point. And you can slice it up and um, it can be pickled. It can be um, added stir fries near the end of the stir fry if you want it to remain somewhat crunchy. And uh, it's absolutely delicious. The heart makes a wonderful sweet pickle. Uh, and I like to make pickles out of them because people are, are really uh, wondering what this funny shaped thing is that is are in the pickles, but it makes a wonderful pickle. And it's also an excellent trail nibble as long as you're somewhere on the trail where the water is clean and you can find it to eat in the trail. Cattail pollen creeps. Cattail pollen, that yellow pollen that's on the top makes a wonderful light crepe. And uh, you can harvest the yellow cattail pollen by shaking the pollen rich male portion of the flower into a bag. You're going to need rubber boots or bring a couple pieces of plywood to throw down in front of you to get to where the cattails usually grow. And uh, I usually take a uh, plastic milk jug and cut a hole about the size of the, the male portion of the plant and shake it into that because it doesn't blow all over the place. Clean pollen by winnowing it with a fine screen. When you winnow something, you take and put the, the pollen on a very fine screen and um, shake it and the um, light matter that you don't want mixed with your pollen will actually blow away. I use a little fan for a semi-breezy day. Collect a half cup of cattail pollen, a half cup of all-purpose flour. Many other flours may be substitute. Use two large eggs, half cup of milk. You can use almond milk. Half cup of water, a quarter teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of butter melted. And in a large mixing bowl, whisk together the flours and the eggs. Gradually add in the milk and water, stirring to combine. Add the salt and butter and beat until smooth. Uh, if you've ever made crepes, it's a rather uh, wet batter, not like pancakes. Heat a lightly oiled griddle or frying pan over medium high heat. Pour or scoop the batter onto the griddle using approximately a quarter cup for each crepe. Tilt the pan with a circular motion so that the batter coats the surface evenly. It will cook very quickly and you can peel it out of the pan. Absolutely delicious. The flavor is distinctive. Um, I don't know how to describe it. You'll just have to try it. White pine, Pinus strobus, is native to North America. White pine trees average 50 to 80 feet in height when mature, but can grow to 150 feet in height. With the tallest white pine recorded in Paul Smith's, it's actually uh, less than a quarter mile from my house to the woods in uh, New York, reaching a height of 160.4 feet. And I read a recent article where it's been recently measured and it's actually taller than that now, which is taller than the Statue of Liberty. The needles are long, three to five inches and soft with five needles per bunch or bract on each branch. White pine has five White has five letters, white pine has five needles. And if you look here, you'll see where the five needles can be easily found. And red pine has three letters and it has three needles, that's kind of handy. Needles will stay on the twigs for two years, at which time the tree will drop portions of its needles to regrow new ones. And the bark of the young tree is gray green. White pine, also known as the peace tree, played an integral part in the life of the native peoples. Needles were used as tea, pitch was used to make glues and start fires. The cambium was used as a survival food source, either eaten in strips or pounded into flour. The name Adirondacks, which is where I live, came from the Algonquin word Radirux. Originally traced 
translated as they eat mature trees. If you visit the area of the Adirondacks, you'll see an awful lot of things called bark eater, bark eater inns and restaurants. Um, it actually doesn't translate, it didn't translate into that. Tribes would insult each other by calling each other or the other tribe uh, Radamundaks. And it, it was an insult if they failed to provide enough food and game to feed their tribal members for the winter by referring to them as tree eaters. According to local lore, when the Europeans first arrived in the mountains, the Native Americans referred to the settlers as Radamundaks as a warning that the settlers would need to eat trees to survive the harsh winters in the mountains down known as the Adirondacks. The European settlers didn't know that they were, that they were being called Adirondacks and they thought the name of the mountains were going to be, end up being called Adirondacks. The native word used to describe the Adirondack mountains was Agose Rege, winter place or cold place. The descriptive name was due to the brutal winters that came early and stayed late. Pine needles chopped and steeped in water at a ratio of two parts water to one part needles uh, will be used to make a tea that is rich in vitamin C. The tea was used to treat colds as a diuretic and to stave off scurvy. Just make absolutely certain that you do not boil the needles or what you're going to end up with something that tastes like uh, turpentine and that's not very pleasant. Pine resin was used to treat wounds, sores and various insect bites. The pine resin um, boiled down was um, actually became a, a common um, wound ointment known as ichthamol that is still sold. Poultices made from a mixture of pine resin and animal fat were used to treat boils and festering wounds. Whenever you steep an herb, uh, you are steeping it so that you are not removing all of its nutritional value because if you boil it, it actually destroys a lot of the vitamin C and other vitamins. Remove the water after it's been brought to a boil and add the chopped needles to, to taste preference. Uh, if you've never had pine needle tea, you might want to use much less needles <coughs> and, uh, because it can be strong. Cover the container, allow it to sit for 10 minutes, add honey or maple syrup to sweeten. And again, don't boil the needles. This is um, how to harvest the cambium layer, which is the living layer between the bark and the heartwood. Stripping bark from a live tree will eventually kill the tree. Harvest from recently down trees or branches. One nice thing about white pine is it seems that every time there's a storm or the wind has been blowing or the trees are heavy with snow, uh, it drops a lot of the branches and so it's easily harvested. Score the bark until the heartwood is reached, which will be about a half to three quarter of an inches in. Peel back that bark. You can see where this has been scored. Dry, and you'll find the thin layer of cambium, which is pictured here. It will be very moist and very slippery. It is the only part of a tree that we can digest. We can't digest the outer bark, um, the heartwood, the needles, or the pine cones. We can digest pine nuts on some trees. Uh, there are many recipes out there for survival breads where they would take the bark of the trees and dry it and pound it into a flour and add it to their existing flour to make breads that filled your belly, but most of it was not digestible. When you harvest the cambium, you can dry the strips in a dehydrator or oven at 250 degrees until they're very dry and crispy like a potato chip and break easily. And um, they will last years stored in an airtight container. And if you look, you'll see that this is the um, pine cambium after it's been harvested. And this is the top is what it looks like when it's dried, it shrinks about by half. Process the dried strips in a blender to make a golden colored flour. It uh, actually blends quite easily in a blender. 
substitute rad flour to make made to cookie recipes, bread recipes, and breading recipes for fish and wild game. And actually, when it is cooked or in a recipe, has an almost um, citrusy flavor. The flour is fully digestible. The outer bark and heartwood are not digestible in any form. Flour is rich in vitamin C, although some will be lost during cooking. And that's high in, on all other vitamins, minerals, and fiber. Um, that, you know, usable fiber. Um, many a, a lost hunter or um, a lost native hunter uh, survive by eating the cambium layer of the pine trees. This is uh, white pine cookies, and uh, this is a picture displayed. And I know that both John and MB have had the white pine cookies, and they can attest to the flavor. They are quite delicious, and <clears throat> they're made with uh, the pine flour. To make them, take one cup of butter, one and a half cups of sugar, brown sugar, maple sugar, white sugar, raw sugar, whichever type of sugars you would like to use, two large eggs, three cups of regular flour. Um, you can try it if you uh, don't wanna make a lot of the pine flour, you can add six to 10 tablespoons of pine flour. I usually add quite a bit more because I tend to make more when it's available. Add one and a half teaspoons of baking soda, one quarter teaspoon salt. You can omit the salt if you're using salted butter. And you can roll the, the cookie dough in um, three tablespoons of sugar with cinnamon added if you'd like, or I don't usually because I like just the taste of the cookie as is. Preheat the oven to 350 degrees, cream the butter, one and a half cups of sugar and eggs thoroughly in a large bowl. Combined flours, baking soda, and salt in a separate bowl. Blend dry ingredients into butter mixture. Chill dough to 10 to 15 minutes in the refrigerator. While dough is chilling, mix three tablespoons of sugar and three teaspoons of cinnamon in a small bowl, if you would like. Scoop one inch balls of dough into the sugar cinnamon mixture, again optional. And uh, you can coat by rolling the dough in the sugar mi mixture. Place on a it's not necessary that the cookie sheet be chilled, but um, I suggest that you put it on parchment paper on any cookie, cookie sheet. That's ungreased. Bake 10 to 12 minutes until they start to firm slightly and turn a light golden color. Remove from the pan immediately and cool on a rack. John uh, placed in the chat box, don't eat the dried bark plain. He says it's yucky. Uh, I can attest to the face he made when he uh, tasted the dry bark. I will tell you that eating the cambium bark is something that is, um, you should try it. It tastes like a pine tree smells. Um, so it's not something that other than if you are in a survival situation, you're going to eat. Um, just for the fun of it, because it tastes good. These are some pictures of meals uh, made with some of the plants that we've discussed. Uh, this is um, uh, Queen Anne's lace and tempura batter being fried. This is a stir fry that has, I can see a lamb's quarters, um, milkweed buds, and I'm sure there are some uh, ramp, um, ramps in there and some uh, commercially grown mushrooms because um, I don't supply wild mushrooms to people. And so there are several stir fries. The big pot was there for everyone made dandelion pasta, which is pasta made with mashed dandelion mixed into the dough. And um, that was boiled. And the picture here, this is probably stinging nettle or lamb's quarter pesto on uh, red clover bread. And uh, this would have been uh, perhaps uh, dandelion or something fritters. And these were burdock french fries. And this was cream of milkweed soup. So I hope everybody's hungry. And if you have questions, this is a great time to 
ask. And how many of these things have anyone eaten before this evening? Pat, there's a question about wintergreen. Uh, wintergreen um, is uh, uh, wonderful to pick and put in your mouth and chew lightly uh, when you are on the trail. Make sure you don't pull the plant up because it doesn't doesn't do well if it's been disturbed, but break off a leaf. The leaves are uh, feel almost plastically. They're shiny. They stay close to the ground, grow in pine forests. They um, have um, salicylic acid, which is um, aspirin. And so if you um, have a slight headache on the trail, you can actually um, get about a quarter of a baby aspirin from sucking on a leaf. The leaves are not digestible. So, you know, if you chew it and swallow it, it's going to come out looking like it did when it went in. Um, wintergreen is used to make wintergreen oil, which is both a, a uh, scent and a seasoning. Um, and you can make wintergreen tea. What else would you like to know about wintergreen? I hope that answered your questions. Any other questions? The berries, the berries are edible. Uh, they taste very much like the leaves and uh, they are generally white and found uh, very close to the ground and um, at the base of the leaves. Is there a lookalike? Not that I have found because the winter green leaf is so distinctive and plasticky feeling and shiny that there is really nothing else that I have come across that looks like it. You're welcome. And if you're not sure whether the leaf is winter green, all you have to do is break it and smell it. It is very distinctly winter green smelling including the berries. If you take your thumb and, and scratch the berry, you'll, you'll find a distinctive wintergreen smell. <laughs> I, I like to uh, have a little wintergreen in my mouth. It also is wonderful if you put the wintergreen leaf in your mouth broken and, and just kind of suck on it because if you're on the trail and you're thirsty, it. Um, it stops your thirst for a while. So thank you. Uh, I think we are done for the evening and um, happy foraging. Have a great evening, everyone.